Okay, so we will have the slides available um, that to share with you after the fact, and we'll also share them on our social media channels. My name is Stacy Ullery. I'm the Assistant Director for Career Education at the UCLA Career Center. And before we get into the content of the session, I'm just going to spend a few minutes giving an overview of some of the Career Center services and how you can access those, especially during this time um, of campus closure. And um, I think you're all familiar with Handshake because you wouldn't have been able to find the webinar link without accessing Handshake. But a quick overview, Handshake is the Career Center's kind of one-stop shop online portal for um, almost every service that we offer. So whether you're looking to schedule an appointment with a, a career counselor or graduate school advisor, um, or you're looking for jobs and internships to apply to, you're interested in educational webinars, information sessions by employers or schools, all everything that we offer you can access through Handshake. Here's a little snapshot of our upcoming events for April. You can see that despite the campus closure, we are still very active and we're continuing to provide um, Ed educational career related programs to our students. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but you can take a look at uh, just a snapshot of the things I only highlighted what is what may be relevant to those of you interested in pursuing graduate and or um, professional school on the screen, but we have at least five times this many programs live in Handshake right now. In addition, we have our May schedule is still coming together, but we already know a few things that we have coming up in May and you can see those on the screen. So please take a look at Handshake and register for any of the events that you're interested in attending. In addition to our events, we also have um, one-on-one -on -one pre-professional and graduate school advising with our staff. And now is a great time to schedule appointments at the Career Center. We're used to being booked up um, almost as soon as we put our appointments in, but with everyone adjusting to their new lives, um, it's been a little bit slower at the Career Center, so there's a lot of availability. So if you go into Handshake, and you can see the link there on your screen, um, you should be able to um, schedule an appointment to talk to somebody about your professional school or grad school plans. These are just some of the topics that we can help you with during those sessions. And we're doing all of our sessions over Zoom. Um, we can talk broadly about your career exploration and planning, guide you through the whole professional and graduate school application process, how to find relevant opportunities. We can review your resume and cover letter. Um, we can do mock interviews related to the job search or grad school and we can also give you direct feedback on your personal statement. If you are pre-health, so that is pre-med or interested in any other health profession, we also have two additional uh, resources I want to bring to your attention. One is the prehealth.ucla.edu website that has a lot of information about pre-health services across UCLA, not just at the Career Center. So it's really a central location for anything pre-health related. Um, and then we also have a Facebook page that is also a collaborative effort with multiple campus departments uh, where we highlight events, opportunities, deadlines, timely reminders, and tips to help you through your process. So please follow the Facebook page to stay up to date with upcoming events across campus. If you're getting ready to graduate this quarter, uh, congratulations. And we wanted to let, make sure you knew what services you have access to at the Career Center. You, as a graduating senior, you will have full access to the Career Center services for three months after graduation. So if you're graduating in June, you will still be able to access all of our services, including one-on-one -on -one appointments through the end of the summer, so through September. 
And then for a full year after that, you'll still have access to our events and to Handshake, just not to the one-on-one -on -one advising. So with that, that's a little overview of our services. I want to launch a quick poll so that we know who is in the audience today and kind of where you are in your process. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. Please um, take a second to fill out those questions. Okay, so looking at these right now, I see that about half of the audience are seniors, and the other half is about evenly split between juniors and sophomores. Um, the vast majority are interested in some type of health professional school, followed by grad school in a STEM field. And then most of you have not yet started writing your personal statement or are in the brainstorming phase. Um, so most of you are in the very early stages of thinking about your personal statements. So thank you all so much. I'm going to end the polling now and you'll all be able to see the results. And with that, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker and hand it over to um, Shirag Shamasian. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Stacy for the introduction and thank you for everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my video. Um, hopefully everybody can see me. If you can't see me, um, please let me know in the in the chat box and we will uh, attempt to troubleshoot. I'm also going to go ahead and share my slides. All right. Let's see if I can get these to come up. All right. So um, would someone type in the chat box just to confirm that, yes, you can just see uh, a giant version of, of my slides and, and nothing else? Awesome. Cool. And, uh, and do I show up as well? Okay. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for confirming. So I'll go ahead and, and close the chat box um, and, again, introduce myself. I'm Dr. Shamasian. I help students uh, get into... To medical school um, as well as dental schools and other uh, programs of the sort and I'm really excited to, to chat with you all today about the medical school personal statement and <clears throat> I saw that you know a majority of the people here are interested in health professions and so even if you're not going to go into medicine specifically whether you're going to apply to be a PA or um, or a dentist or something like that um, this still absolutely applies to you. Um, the, the tenets are the same, right? So the foundation of what makes a great personal statement for, for medicine um, also applies to other areas. So I'm glad that you're here too. I also noticed that the majority of people are seniors. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if, uh, if, you're on, if you're gearing up to apply right now or if you're going to be applying during a future application cycle. But regardless, um, I hope that there are a lot of takeaways here as you think about your extracurricular activities um, and other aspects of your application. So I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, the AMCAS personal statement prompt. So AMCAS is the central MD application system. So if, when you apply to college, if you <clears throat> used Common App, it's very similar. It's very similar to the UC application as well, where you essentially write your personal statement and your work and activities section, which we'll get to later. And uh, that's like an expanded resume. Um, and then this is uh, funneled off to all the different schools that you uh, indicate that you're applying to. And all they tell you for your personal statement is the following. It says, use the space provided to explain why you want to go to medical school. And, you know, I think students have different reactions to this. Um, some students say, that sounds great because I can write about anything I want. And then it quickly turns into, okay, so what do I write about? Um, it's very stressful because med school admissions is super high stakes. Only about 42% of students uh, matriculate into medical school during each application cycle um, with MD program specifically. 
And so there's a lot of stress, like they're asking me to write this essay. I don't really have to write this kind of essay for anything else. And now you're asking me to do it when, when all the uh, chips are on the line, so to speak. And so how do I do this in, in about one and a half pages? So I'm going to give you a bunch of examples today. And we're eventually going to walk through paragraph by paragraph how you go from having zero idea all the way to a finished product. And <clears throat> I'm first going to show you two sample introductions, both of which um, are true about me or were true about me at some point in my life. So the facts are true. Um, and, and then we're going to talk about which one uh, you like better and why. I'll, I will um, ask you all to, to enter your responses in the chat box. So the first intro, my traditional Armenian parents presented the following career choices throughout my childhood, doctor, dentist, engineer, or lawyer. I played along with this game of deliberation. I won multiple awards debating international policy in Model UN, studied hard to achieve a high GPA as a human development major, and volunteered hundreds of hours in multiple hospital settings. I kept my parents guessing all along, but in my mind, there was never really a decision to make. I knew I wanted to treat people's ailments, physical and emotional. All right, so the second intro. Growing up in LA, I was quite the troublemaker. My parents often recall me wreaking havoc in and out of the house, hiding important bills and cookware and playing in the dirt. However, their concern peaked when I was eight years old and unable to control my facial tics. Soon I was ridiculed by classmates and struggled to maintain focus in class. When I was finally diagnosed with Tourette syndrome at age nine, my parents didn't fully understand the effects it would have on our lives. Despite my youth, I knew Tourette syndrome would significantly shape my world and future goals. So which intro do you like better? Um, feel free to type it in the chat box. You can write intro one or intro two, and then we'll chat about them. So intro one, just as a reminder, is this one. Intro two is the one about Tourette syndrome. Awesome. All right. So it's already overwhelmingly number two. I don't think I've, I've seen a number one vote yet. Um, and this is very consistent with the response I've received uh, from students in the past. So the second one tends to appeal much more to students and by extension admissions committees um, for a few reasons. Uh, number one is much more of a narrative resume, right? These are all things that you could have learned about me um, from my resume. Me listing them doesn't, doesn't give you a deeper sense of who I am or why I want to be a doctor, really. I mean, I know I mentioned something at the end, but it's not really that compelling. Um, you know, some folks have said, well, it's, it doesn't seem like you're personally motivated to do it. You're doing it because your parents wanted you to. Um, also, if, uh, you know, this is true of a lot of students whose uh, parents are, are immigrants, right? Where you can say, where they essentially told you, you know, you should do X, Y, and Z career, they're stable, they're high earning, they're respected, or whatever the case might be. So if a student who is, say, Korean American, you know, swaps out Armenian for Korean, they can write this too. Um, and this applies, of course, to, to many other groups as well. The reason I bring that up is because it fails a test of, you know, could anybody else have written this? And the answer in this case is a clear yes. And you don't want it to be a clear yes when you're writing your personal statement. You want your essay to be very distinct um, and something that only you could have written. The second personal statement intro example does that, right? Where it highlights not only, you know, the fact that I have Tourette syndrome, um, which is not ultra common, uh, but also my personal reflections and my, you know, my childhood as it relates to that and how that served as the springboard um, for me to develop an interest in, in healthcare, right? So if uh, sometimes uh, students think, well, I don't have something like that. I don't have that kind of challenge or what have you. And it's completely okay if you do not have uh, you know, a condition that you grew up with or something in your family or, or, or anything of that nature. The, the goal is to make the essay personal enough, meaning um, how you responded to certain situations, how you felt about things, insights you developed in a way that nobody else can replicate. And, and I promise you, having done this work for quite some time, that every single student you included um, will have something that is going to be very compelling to admissions committees, right? Because when I wake up every day, I don't think, wow, I'm so special. People must want to learn all about me. I, I actually think I'm just kind of a regular guy. And, and I know that most students, when I speak to them, they also think that they're 
just, you know, regular people. And there isn't something about them that's super jaw dropping and compelling. But when we live our lives as ourselves, we don't think we're that unique or distinct or something like that. But I assure you that other people want to learn about you. And there are aspects of your background that are really compelling to them. So um, we're going to uh, we're going to transition now. And before I do that, I want to highlight the last sentence here uh, and, you know, show you how a hook is done. Oftentimes you hear about a hook or a cliffhanger at the end of a, um, of a paragraph that wants you to learn more. So here it's, despite my youth, I knew Tourette's syndrome would significantly shape my world and future goals. Essentially, it's setting up the story of how this served as um, the initial nudge um, toward healthcare. All right, so um, a little bit about me. Um, I did my undergrad at Cornell. Um, I was actually pre-med the whole time, had done quite well there, uh, graduated a 3.9-ish GPA. And, uh, but I was doing a lot of mental health research at the time. And, you know, growing up with Tourette syndrome, I was really called to, to switch gears and pursue my PhD in, in clinical psych. And, uh, but along the way, I was doing a lot of work with admissions. So I was helping a bunch of students uh, get into medical school. And over time, people started asking me for a lot more help. And so for over 15 years, I've been helping students get into top med schools. And uh, it's really done through, you know, making sure to choose the right schools, which I believe is the one of the most underrated pieces of the application process. So make sure to choose your school list deliberately. I know you guys have a, a webinar coming up on that, which excites me. Um, making sure to write exceptional essays and, you know, providing coaching to ACE interviews. And over 90% of our students during this time who've signed up for, um, you know, a comprehensive plan and we guided them through this process um, have gone into at least one med school. And, and really the, the way it's done is reflecting very deeply on who you are as a person and what personal and professional experiences have led you to medicine, what qualities you want to convey to the admissions committee. And if you're able to think through what narrative you want to communicate across your application materials, not just your personal statement, then you'll maximize your chances of getting in. But the personal statement is incredibly important because it's the foundation, right? It's the, it's the sort of 30,000 foot view of who you are, what's your path to medicine, and then you'll use the other sections of your application, like the work and activities to talk about what you've done day to day, and then secondaries to highlight your fit with each individual school. Um, which is a, a topic for a different conversation, um, but just to give you some context about how this all fits together. All right, so let's jump into the, uh, the meat of this presentation. Um, I received the question uh, about, you know, what sorts of personal experiences should we avoid talking about? For example, is it too risky to talk about your sexuality? It's an interesting question. Um, I'll tackle some of this uh, throughout the talk, but I'll tell you at a high level um, to the anonymous attendee that there aren't really off-limit topics so long as you handle things with the appropriate sensitivity and, and delicateness. Um, because the, the goal is not to think about, to look at a list and say, oh, which one's the most unique or which one should I write about that's going to stand out the most. But you have to ask yourself anytime you're considering an experience, the following question, what's the point? Uh, and, and what that means is, okay, should I, should I write about topic X or topic Y? I don't know what's the point. In other words, what are you trying to communicate through that topic? And if it fits the overall narrative, then I think it could be a great idea. If it doesn't, it might be um, material for a different section. But thank you for, um, for sharing that question. All right. So the first step <clears throat> when you're writing your application, when you're writing your personal statement, you will likely go through an experience where you are, you know, staring at your CV. Uh, and you're looking at all your different experiences and you look at this list and you ask yourself, which of these activities should I write about? And, you know, I don't know, I don't know where to go. So let's assume that your friend comes to you with this profile and says, Hey, like, which one of these should, should I start my personal statement with? Um, please type in the chat box, uh, which one and why it could be very brief. I just want to get a sense of, um, the way people are, are thinking about this. I'll take a quick pause. So um, someone mentions whatever means most to you and that reflects values that connect to medicine. 
I like that response because it's not about at the surface level choosing a topic um, that you think might be impressive or something like that, but rather reflecting on what it is that you want to communicate. So that's great. Um, there's not a single right answer, uh, whichever one you're most passionate about and shows uniqueness, uh, none specifically. Yeah, you guys are, you guys are onto something uh, in that, you know, a lot of people will look at the list and they'll say, which one's the most unique, which one um, is a topic that no one else is going to write about. But this is not a competition of uniqueness. In other words, if you think about it, <clears throat> 50 something thousand people apply to MD programs each year. And every single, you know, if you take that over 10 years, that's over half a million people. Chances are you're not going to write about a topic that no one else has written about, right? So this is not a competition in uniqueness um, in terms of the topic chosen, but rather, you know, what it is about yourself you communicate. And can you really convince admissions committees that you not only want to pursue medicine, but that you've shown it and that you've shown the type of physician that you might one day be. So the qualities really matter here. Um, and, and so I encourage you to not think about this from an act, act I guess a, an activities first standpoint, but from a, a qualities first standpoint. So first reflecting on what it is that we wanna communicate. So the, uh, the list I showed you were from an actual student. And so the qualities that they wanted to communicate were that they are curious, <clears throat> that they're caring, and that they're innovative. So with that lens, I asked, okay, which of these experiences best highlight, you know, the fact that you are curious, caring, and innovative? <clears throat> and they did, in fact, choose number two, being a science teacher's aide for their intro. Again, not because it's unique, but because it highlights what they want to highlight. So this brings up a, a point and <clears throat> goes back to what the what one of the attendees asked earlier, you know, is is this too personal or can I write about any topic or all this kind of stuff? So there is no such there's no such thing as a good or bad topic, only strong or poor execution. Okay. So I've seen essays written about I don't know, pretty much every topic at this point, and I've seen good examples and poor examples of everything. So the topic itself doesn't make or break your essay. It's how you pull it off that matters. And, and that's one of the big take-home points here, um, that you focus on what you're trying to communicate, not just what, you know, which experience you chose. So there's another question, let me see, um, from, uh, from one of the students that asks, how many activities should you talk about in your personal statement? It varies. I've seen one. I've seen... Uh, up to four, I would say, for uh, really good essays. More than that, I think you're spreading yourself too thin because you won't be able to achieve sufficient depth um, with each one. But good question. Uh, it's a question that's shared by, by many people. Okay, so there are four pillars of a great personal statement. Number one is you have to demonstrate your qualities. Uh, number two, you have to focus on the applicant, meaning you, versus other people. Um, number three is has to be unique to you, meaning personal enough to you where only you could have written it and achieve sufficient depth um, with, with each experience and, and the essay as a whole. So with that framework, we're actually going to analyze um, a great personal statement, one that uh, helped a student get into a top five school and despite not having perfect numbers. Um, and we'll go through it paragraph by paragraph. Okay, so... I'm gonna go ahead and read. Sorry, I'm just trying to move some of the windows that are open so it doesn't uh, block my view of the text. All right, sure. It was a little more crowded, cluttered and low tech, but Mr. Jackson's biology classroom at David Starr Jordan High School in South LA seemed a lot like the one in which I first learned about intermolecular forces and equilibrium constants. Subconsciously, I just assumed teaching the 11th graders about the workings of the cardiovascular system would go smoothly. Therefore, I was shocked when my four student group, <clears throat> when in my four student group, I could only get Nate's attention. Cameron kept texting, Mercedes wouldn't end their FaceTime call, and Juanita was repeatedly distracted by her friends. After unsuccessfully pleading for the group's attention a few times, I realized the students weren't wholly responsible for the disconnect. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to pause here and, and tackle um, or cover a little bit of what's going on here. So this, you see that it starts in the middle of a story. This isn't necessary to do, um, but oftentimes students do it to really grab the reader initially. And note that it's not um, extreme. Oftentimes I see that students start their, um, 
essays almost uh, almost a little bit overboard, where they think they have to write about how when they were working in the emergency department, someone came in with a level four, I don't know, complex condition, and everyone was all hands on deck, and you know, the doctor did this one thing that saved the person's life, and that's the moment they knew they wanted to be a doctor. Um, so it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, when I polled students in the past, only 10% of students, I would say, if not less, um, had, you know, truly have a quote unquote moment where they decided to be a physician or that, you know, that experience was so impactful uh, in helping them decide. It oftentimes, uh, you know, is, is much more, I guess, gradual than that, or maybe there are other experiences that are non-medical um, that demonstrate the qualities that they want to communicate. So this person chose this experience because they want to show their curiosity and, um, like I said, their, their caring nature and how innovative they are. And so right now they're in a situation where they kind of don't have control, right? So they're teaching this class. Um, it seems like an under-resourced kind of class. And uh, they're trying to get all these kids' attention, and at this point, uh, they are not doing a great job. But there is a nice sentence at the end that says, after unsuccessfully pleading with the students, um, the students weren't wholly responsible for the disconnect. So there are other factors, and, and we're going to find out what those are. So it's very personal in that it's the specific student's specific experience. All right, let's see how this continues. <clears throat> Perhaps the problem was one of engagement rather than a lack of interest since their focus waned when I started using terminology like vena cava, that was probably gibberish to them. So I drew a basic square diagram broken into quarters for the heart and a smiley face for the body cells that needed oxygen and nutrients. I left out structure names to focus on how four distinct chambers kept the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood separate, prompting my students with questions like, what happens after the smiley face takes the oxygen? This approach enabled my students to draw conclusions themselves. We spent much of class time going through the eight figure loop, but they're leaning over the table to see the diagram more clearly and blurting out answers demonstrated their engagement and fundamental understanding of the heart as a machine. My elation was obvious when they remembered it the following week. Okay, so some students might see this and say, well, what does this have to do with that? Yes, I know it's about the heart, but like, I don't know why you want to be a doctor and all that kind of stuff. Let's think about those qualities again, right? Where uh, curious, innovative, and caring. So this, this person was curious in that they uh, wanted to know why the students weren't learning, right? So I was like, what is going on? It's probably not just, you know, their issue. There's, there's more to it. Um, they're certainly caring in that they wanted the students to learn and they, uh, and they really focused on, you know, what the, what the issue was and trying to find solutions. And then they actually were very innovative in, in developing a solution. And the, the solution is, is sort of elegant in its simplicity, right? It's like, let's break this down to its most fundamental uh, elements and we see the impact of that. Oftentimes I see students talk about what they did, but they don't really talk about the impact of that thing. So I don't know if it was a good idea. Was it impressive? Did it work? Um, and, you know, showing the before and after and how you sort of manipulated the situation, um, that, that can be very effective in showing how your creativity is not just a, a cool quality you have, but is actually making um, your, you know, your community a better place. All right. So I'm going to um, take a few questions. So there is someone who says, uh, since this example mentions intermolecular forces, how technical should the personal statement be? Will the readers of the application uh, be medical school faculty or do they work in student affairs? Um, and good question. Um, so there are going to be faculty who read it. There are going to be medical students who read it. Uh, some schools even ask, you know, uh, certain administrative staff to read it because they want to know, would you want this person to be your physician? Because ultimately you're going to be serving your community and your patients aren't uh, all going to be folks who sit on a medical school admissions committee. And so you have to, that's why you don't want to focus too much on like sounding too pre med or, or anything like that. The goal is to communicate why you and why medicine, right? And your path to medicine, some of your insights along the way. I would argue that the word, the term intermolecular forces isn't really that technical and, and it doesn't really detract from the point. In other words, like you're talking about, you're teaching science class. Right. And that's really the takeaway. Um, and it's not lost. If, you, if it's if you're starting to get into like, 
a lot of specific techniques and specific proteins and calcium channels and things like that, you're probably going overboard um, for the pers pur purposes of a personal statement, but it really is context dependent depending on what you're trying to communicate. All right. So I'll move on to, to step two. So we've used the science teacher's aid um, experience at the inner city school. And um, at this point, we have a decision to make of, you know, where are we going to go next? Um, so I'll, uh, so when we, we looked at this with this student, we were thinking, all right, we have, we have these other 10 experiences and I'm really not sure where to go next. Um, so how do we filter this? And I encourage the student, as I, as I do with a lot of students, to think of the personal statement as a funnel. A funnel, we all know, starts wide at the top and then gets narrower and narrower over time. It gets more focused, in a sense, over time. And so if you start your essay with something that is not directly medically relevant, like teaching a science class to, to mid middle schoolers, then we probably want to drill down and get um, closer to medicine. Uh, and when I say medicine, it doesn't have to be like, uh, you know, clinical care. It could be research. It could be, it could be something else. But so long as you're not getting away from it. So for instance, right now, it would be very strange if I transitioned to talking about being a fraternity president. Unless there was some like, I don't know, crazy situation where you had to intervene um, and, you know, get medical help or, or, or whatever the case might be. Uh, it, that's probably not a good idea. Um, at this point, again, camp counselor, same thing, unless there was something specific that happened there, probably not a great idea. So that leaves us with fewer choices, and that's an effect, effective filter once you think about the, the funnel um, analogy. All right, so we have to provide some context. So I'm a big uh, basketball fan, a big Laker fan, having grown up uh, in LA. So if I gave you a scenario like LeBron James hits the jump shot, and I tell you one context, it's second quarter of a regular game versus uh, the last game of the playoffs and the finals, I guess the fourth quarter, everything's on the line. Um, obviously, the second shot seems much more meaningful. Um, I'm also a, a big fan of the television show, The Bachelor. My wife got me into it several years ago. And I feel like I've watched like 90% of the episodes in the last like three, four years. Um, but essentially, like if somebody gives out a rose on the first day, right? It's not going to be as meaningful when there are like 30 other contestants still there versus when, you know, they're going to give the final rows to, um, you know, the, the, one of the two folks who, uh, who are left uh, on that season, right? So the context really matters when things happen. So if you write your personal statement with just like a bunch of different experiences, but you don't really explain what's going on and why and why you transition from one to the other, it's going to seem just a bunch of like, okay, cool, like, you did that thing, but how does this all tie in together? So we have to build in meaningful transitions um, and provide context. So, so where did this person's like initial interest stem from? Um, let's, let's find out with the context paragraph. So ever since my middle school robotics days, when a surgeon invited us to LA County USC Medical Center to unwrap Tootsie Rolls with the Da Vinci surgical system, I felt that a physician's role goes beyond serving patients and families. I feel an additional responsibility to serve as a role model to younger students, especially teenagers who may be intrigued by STEM fields and medicine. Furthermore, my experience in Mr. Jackson's classroom demonstrated the substantial benefits of assessing specific individuals' needs, even when it requires diverging slightly from the structured plan. Being flexible to discover how to best engage my students in some ways parallels the problem-solving aspect I love about medicine. So check out how beautiful the transitions are in this paragraph. Um, the, there, there are so many things going on here at the sentence level, but also at the paragraph level. So there's, there's the obvious parallel between how when this student was in middle school versus the middle, you know, working in the middle school now and the students today, um, that's, that's a really nice, uh, that's a really nice, I guess, side by side. But it also talks about why they were in the middle school. Oftentimes, pre-med students will pursue experiences because they think it looks good or because, you know, Jim or Sally is doing that thing and they, they're doing it because, um, you know, they think it's the most impressive or they'll fall behind. But this student um, specifically chose to work at a middle school and teach science because that was a really form like that was a very formative time for them uh, in terms of, uh, you know, deciding that they want to pursue medicine. And not only that, they talk about how the seed was planted 
uh, you know, at, in Mr. Jackson's classroom, um, how, it, how important it is to be flexible and to, you know, to think on your feet and assess the situation to achieve uh, the ideal outcomes, even when the situation is not perfect or clean cut. And if you're wondering like, well, you know, what did that paragraph have to do with medicine and all that kind of stuff? You see now how the qualities that she's um, describing through anecdotes and through this context paragraph are exactly what we want in a physician. We all want a physician who can be flexible and think on their feet and find really uh, innovative ways to solve problems. And when we hear that this person is really passionate about it, um, it's really compelling and, uh, and will help the students um, you know, shine. So some, uh, some questions that came up here. Uh, if you talk about an activity in your personal statement, should you expand upon it again, your three most meaningful activities on the activity section or pick different ones? Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's totally fine to highlight something in your personal statement and then also highlight it in your work and activity section. Uh, does this approach work for PhD programs as well? Absolutely. You can start with an anecdote and then funnel down from there. Um, again, a lot of the things that we're talking about here are not unique to, to just the medical school personal statement. There's so much, uh, there's so much uh, that can be applied to different fields. Is it okay to reuse part of a college application for a professional school application? I suppose if it's written very well and, uh, and it applies to what you're applying for, um, then, then I don't see an issue. But make sure not to uh, just cut and paste things in a cookie cutter way. Be really thoughtful about the programs you're applying to. Okay, moving on after the context paragraph. Um, so we haven't even transitioned to another experience yet, right? We just, we talked about the, the middle school class and then we talked about her, the student's formative uh, middle school experience. That serves as a bridge, as a context for, you know, the work that, um, this person has done en route to medical school. So if we think about that funnel, it, it really uh, helps us filter out most things other than number three, number one, number seven, and number 11, which are, I guess, directly uh, medically relevant. And so we're going to talk about which ones might be the best idea. So she could have transitioned to clinical research, where she talks about how uh, she wants to study real world phenomena and help people. Um, international med volunteer to talk about how different people perceive the world in medicine, um, how people, uh, I guess, in not in a traditional clinical setting with the wilderness EMT trainee, but how you can treat physical and emotional ailments or clinical shattering where they uh, sort of observe the physician. So this student could go in any of these directions, but our goal again is not to just choose something because we're like, oh, we got to get to the medicine part, like. <laughs> I'm in a rush. No, you have to be very thoughtful about curiosity, being caring, and being innovative. And for this student specifically, there, was a, there were some in, interesting experiences uh, through their clinical research that highlighted that. So that's where we went next. And so after we do, so we have an intro paragraph, we have a context paragraph typically, and then we move on to these experiences. And uh, the first experience paragraph reads as follows. <clears throat> Clinical experiences go even further by beautifully merging this curiosity satisfying side of medicine with what I feel is most fulfilling, the human side of care provision. My experience with a tiny three-year-old boy and his mother in genetics clinic confirmed the importance of the latter. Not only was I excited to meet him because he presented with a rare condition, but also because he and his chromosomal deletion had been the focus of my recent clinical case report published in Genetics in Medicine. While researching his dysmorphic features and dis disabilities, other patients with similar deletions and the possible genes contributing to his symptoms, I stayed up until 4 a.m. for several weeks, too engrossed to sleep. What was more exciting than learning about the underlying signs, however, was learning about the opportunity to meet the boy and his mother in person and share my findings with them. All right, so we see now it's like, okay, in the previous context paragraph, they said, look, I want to I wanna solve problems on the fly. I want to work with people directly. And now it's saying, look, I've been studying this thing for a while, and now I have the opportunity to, um, to meet a patient and their family with this condition to see what it's really like. And again, curiosity is like just jumping off of the page here. This person is like a total nerd in the best way, right? Staying up until 4 a.m., studying all this stuff, um, too engrossed to sleep. That, that's really powerful. 
And now we're going to see their caring nature and, and you know, their innovative approach uh, in a moment. But, but they're setting this up very neatly. And you see how paragraph to paragraph, everything flows really well. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and now um, transition to, to what happens next. But, but I want you to see how personal this is. So it's not just I did research, but this is specific research I did. Uh, and this was my experience doing it. And, and linking it to patient care, because sometimes students who have strong research backgrounds tend to get so deep into the research and think that the research is going to impress that they forget that ultimately it's about people. And you have to be able to draw any experience you talk about, especially research, to patient care. How will this help people? And if you miss that, then you've missed the boat, right? And, and admissions committees uh, won't be too pleased. All right. So moving on to the next paragraph. As soon as I walked into the examination room, I noticed the mother avoiding eye contact with the genetic counselor while clutching her son to her chest. I sensed her anxiety and disinterest in hearing about my research conclusions. The impact of her son's condition on their daily lives probably transcended the scientific details in my report. So despite my desire to get into the science, I restrained myself from overwhelming her. Instead, I asked her to share details about the wonderful interventions she had procured for her son, speech and physical therapy, sign language lessons, special feeds, etc. Through our conversations, I realized that she was really looking for reassurance for doing a great job caring for her son. I validated her efforts and offered relief that there were other families navigating similar difficulties. As the appointment progressed, I observed her gradually relaxing. Rather than feel weighed down by the research findings I was eager to get off my chest, I felt light as well. All right. So we see here again, very curious and um, she's always observing what's going on. Um, there was, there were, you know, doesn't want to hear about my research conclusion because I'm really observant and I noticed that she was nervous and clutching her son tight. Um, and, you know, I wanted to get into the science, but that's not what the people want. That's not what the family wanted or needed. Right. So I put the focus on them. I'm because this person is caring. She wants to learn about them and show the family that she is putting them first above the science, above the treatment plan, above all of these things. And uh, so they took a, an innovative approach, not that connecting with someone and asking about them is innovative in the sense that it's not like, a, <laughs> it's not like you uh, invented the light bulb or something like that. But, but essentially it's saying, look, I'm solving problems on the fly. And in this case, the problem is there's an anxious family who's kind of nervous about this setting and they're like, what are they going to ask us to do? Are they just going to recommend another thing? It's like my schedule's already. Hi everyone, it seems that um, Dr. Shamasian's Zoom account may have frozen. Sharag, if you can hear us, uh, we're no longer able to hear you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it looks like he's just left the session. If you all can wait for a minute, let's give him a few minutes to get back online and hopefully he'll be able to pick up right where he left off. While we're waiting, uh, I just wanted to make an announcement to everyone, especially those of you who joined later um, in the session, that the 
Career Center does offer personal statement critiques, and you can schedule one through your Handshake account. And um, the Undergraduate Writing Center is also offering online appointments during this time to and they also give feedback on personal statements. So the Career Center, when we review your personal statement, we look at it primarily from a content perspective um, about whether this is setting, showcasing your skills and your qualities in the best way possible for your goal. Um, the Undergraduate Writing Center can look at it more from a writing standpoint, grammar, syntax. So we always recommend getting pers both perspectives and actually getting as many perspectives as possible, even from friends, peers, mentors, professionals, anybody whose opinions you value and trust. If you have any questions about Career Center services or um, anything else that we can answer while we wait for Shirag to join, please feel free to Type those in the q and I'm taking a look. It looks like we had a question. How can we RSVP for other pre-health Zoom sessions? I checked Handshake, but it seems like it's missing some events such as how to choose a medical school. That's a great question. Um, that one should be in there for April 27th. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't be able to see it. So those should be visible for every undergraduate student. Um, if you're a grad student, it might be a permissions issue for that particular program, but I can look into it. But for all, but for all of our sessions, you should be able to look in Handshake in the events tab and register for any of our upcoming pre-health events. You've been uh, posting an answer to this one in the chat, but in case you haven't seen it, um, yes, we are recording this event and it will be available most likely within the next 24 hours. We will post it on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash prehealthucla, and we'll email a link to you um, once it's published, as long as you have filled out the attendance survey. The link to the attendance survey is in the chat. Field. Another question, just to clarify, after we graduate, we would only be able to receive feedback on personal statements, cover letters, etc. for three months after we graduate and not for the year. That is correct. So um, as a recent alum, you have access to one-on-one -on -one advising for the three months after graduation. And then for the next year after that, you still have access to Handshake, um, and all of our events, but not to one-on-one -on -one advising. Should we provide a copy of our personal statement before the one-on-one -on -one sessions, or do you read it during them? Um, if you have the email address of your counselor ahead of time, you can feel free to email it ahead of time. Um, I know it just depends on their workload and their workflow, but if, if they have time, Sometimes they, they will be able to read it before the session and that can save a little bit of time. Um, but it never hurts. It at least um, makes it go a little bit more smoothly once you're in the session. You don't have to take up um, part of your 30 minutes figuring out how to email it to the counselor. Okay, welcome back. We have Dr. Shamasian back on the line. Hey. We've just been fielding questions about Career Center Services in the meantime. <laughs> Okay, I uh, I have no idea what happened. Um, I think my internet went out. Um, it's raining uh, where I am down in San Diego, and so maybe some issue with that. I I, I sincerely apologize. Um, and Stacey, um, we can. Um, I know you're recording this and the previous thing. Uh, we can also probably help you um, join both videos together. Okay, um, great. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to take any help editing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I want to apologize to everybody here and um, thank you for your patience while I um, figured out the the connection stuff. Okay, I sh I should be um, I should have my slides back on. Is that correct? 
Yes, they're back. 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 Okay, thank you, Stacey. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for your grace. Um, and uh, it was actually, um, the, I guess the, the good thing was that I was sort of done talking about this paragraph anyway, so it, it's, a, it's a decent place to, to break. But coming back um, to where we were, so the student clearly was able to talk about their creativity, um, how caring they are, and how innovative they are um, while you know, discussing a, a medically relevant scenario. So you see how it's not about just showing them, look how much science I know and all this kind of stuff, saying, look, the science is important and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with real people with um, specific healthcare needs and emotions around those needs. And we have to, as uh, physicians, consider all of those factors. So moving on from there, one big question left to answer here is what will medicine allow the student to uniquely do that other fields cannot? We don't have that why medicine question answered yet. So the conclusion focuses on that. Um, at the end of the appointment, the mom offered to help let me hold her son who gazed back at me with his bright blue eyes. While cradling, cradling the little boy humanized the medical details, the mother's gesture displayed profound trust. Above all, this experience allowed me to recognize that interactions between a patient plus family and their doctor are more than intermediary vehicles to treatment. They are critical and beneficial in their own light. In their own right, excuse me. Learning this affirmed my longstanding desire and eagerness to become a physician. While research is essential and will surely always trigger my curiosity, I want my work to transcend the lab bench. Specifically, I want to continue engaging with patients and helping them through life's difficult moments with physical treatment and genuine support. And since working with each patient constitutes an entirely different experience, I know my medical career will never cease to be fulfilling. So you see how um, the student wraps everything up here. Um, they, you know, they talk about, again, the impact of their innovation, not just I did this thing, but we developed so much trust where I was able to actually hold this uh, little boy. And then reflecting on, you know, the, like, it, it's incredible to have these interactions. We can't just focus on the treatment itself or the, you know, the quote unquote active agent or whatever. Um, but that, you know, that matters alongside um, helping people. So oftentimes students tell me, well, I feel like my reasons for wanting to be a doctor are kind of cheesy. They're overdone. I want to help people. I'm like, well, yeah, that's kind of what a doctor is supposed to do. It's how you communicate that that really matters. Um, or, you know, saying, oh, I want to take things from bench to bedside, another like used cliche, but you see how the student demonstrated their willing, their desire to do that. So when she says here, I want my work to transcend the lamp bench, you don't think that it's cliche because she's actually talked about it. And so this is what I mean about the themes have been covered before. It's how to infuse enough personal details and experiences where only you could have written it. All right. So a proven personal statement recipe, one that we used here, you don't have to use this recipe, but I strongly advise it for a lot of students. Um, start with an introduction, a highly detailed story, like the one in the, um, in the middle school class. Context, what was happening at the time? What led you there? Uh, and then subsequent events, how one experience led you to another, insights you developed about medicine, and a combination of showing and telling, and then finally a conclusion. You'll see, so the, there was a student earlier um, who asked me, you know, how many experiences should we write about? This person only kind of wrote about two. Yes, there was the context paragraph about middle, the middle school, but that was only a bridge. So it was the middle school class and the clinical research experience, two, for a page and a half. But you see how there were multiple layers covered throughout the presentation that made it very compelling. So very quickly, um, if I may talk about the work and activity section, how it supplements the personal statement. So the work and activity section is huge. It's bigger than the personal statement. You get to write about 15 uh, activities or up to 15. You don't have to use all of them. If you have 10 plus or 12 plus, you're perfectly fine. Um, it's more about quality than quantity. Now, 700 characters each. And three, you get to designate as most meaningful and you get an additional 1,325 characters on top of that. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I want to highlight that your application is huge. Your personal statement sure is a big essay, but the work and activity is big. And then you have the school specific secondaries. So going back to the student's question of how many experiences should I write, use only what you need to get your point across most effectively. Because if you go more, 
you're going to, you know, you're going to treat things at a more surface level and you will have an opportunity across your application to cover everything. So don't feel like space is scarce and I need to fit it all in or something like that. Um, and then use, um, use this section accordingly. And so this student wrote about two research positions and being an outdoor enthusiast organization president. One of the research experiences was the one that they covered in personal statement. And they just took a different angle to it. They might have talked about the research a little bit more. So when you write your personal statement, ask yourself these questions. What qualities do I want to convey? What sets me apart? If you're not sure, ask your ask family members or friends like, hey, when you think of me, what comes to mind? I know it's a strange question to ask, but oftentimes what people think of us is different than what we think of ourselves. And then what events and periods shape you? How do they make you feel? And how can you translate those feelings into positive change? How will medicine uniquely help you accomplish this? Um, so uh, I want to say at, uh, to close this out that, you know, personal statement resources will be emailed to folks who um, provided their email address. Um, we also um, help with the MCAT. So if folks are interested in receiving uh, MCAT questions of the day, I know there's a poll that will be going out later. Um, for that. We have an ebook that covers um, every aspect of the process. We have a blog that covers pretty much every uh, med school admissions uh, topic that you might be interested to learn about. We even have a YouTube channel that's, that's growing. We publish every week there to cover more topics. Um, you have my email at the bottom. If you ever want to contact me or if you want to schedule a consultation, you can do, do so through that um, link up there as well. But I really just want to say thank you um, thanks to, first of all, to Stacy and Christina for, um, for inviting me to, to speak again. It's certainly a pleasure getting to know you too and um, to speak with um, your students and, and to all of you for joining here, uh, especially during you know, <laughs> this, uh, this crazy time when you're already probably stuck at home and taking virtual classes and sitting through yet another um, virtual presentation. I, I'm really grateful for that, um, for your attention and for your questions and participation. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just grateful for your time. And I know that folks uh, have, might have some questions and I have some time. Uh, Stacey and Christina, I don't know about y'all's time frame, but I, I have a little bit of time to, to answer questions too. And to the person who said, thanks, uh, Alec, you're welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shamasi, and we really appreciate um, all of your insights. It's, a, it's an excellent presentation. My pleasure. And um, I do have time to stick around, so I won't end the webinar until you're finished answering the Sounds question. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, there are some, uh, so there was the, there was a, a question uh, from a student that I think, uh, Christina, you answered uh, about, you know, if schools are changing their policy on reviewing applications. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I just want to say uh, you're all in the same boat right now, okay? Whether you're in LA, in New York, or in Chicago, whether your research has been disrupted, your shadowing plans were disrupted, um, everyone is experiencing disruption in some way. And um, schools, I, I suspect, are going to be very uh, generous in terms of, you know, their understanding and and, and all that when it comes to your application. So, you know, the MCAT, the MCAT dates have been canceled through April. So if you were going to take those in April and that's been disrupted, they understand, they, they know that MCAT uh, exam scores are going to come in later this year. If you were hoping to do something in research and that got disrupted, again, that will, um, that will be understood as well. Now, that doesn't mean that you should stop doing stuff and say, ah, you know, I can't do anything anyway. You know, email your PI if you're doing research and ask them, you know, are there data analysis or manuscript writing projects that I can help out with? Um, because if you, you know, continue to make progress, that'll also show your initiate, initiate, excuse me, um, how, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, but essentially that, that you take initiative, uh, that, that's what I meant to say, and you don't just slow down um, because of these circumstances. So there are going to be other opportunities that might have not been available before. In terms of shadowing or patient exposure experiences, that'll obviously be harder because um, they'll largely be seen as quote-unquote non-essential work until, you know, stay-at-home orders and these kinds of things are, are eased. Um, but plant the seeds, um, you know, reach out to people, plant those seeds um, for experiences that you can immediately get into um, after, um, after the stay-at-home orders and lockdowns are, are lifted. Yeah. So um, what other questions do you all have? Uh, you can write it in the um, you can write in the Q&A chat box or the, or the main chat box. Uh, someone asks, do you have any tips for reapplicants writing a personal statement? 
Um, yeah, we actually have a reapplicant guide um, that covers this in depth. Essentially, you have to you have to substantially change your statement. That doesn't mean that the theme has to change. It doesn't mean you have to use all new experiences. Um, but the approach you take certainly has to, and you should think you should probably rewrite um, the statement. You know, when you're applying as a reapplicant, you sort of have to question everything. You have to question, was my school list too competitive? Um, what, were my stats good enough? Uh, was my writing good? Because we've worked with many students over the years who were reapplicants, and one cycle they have like one or two interviews and don't get in, and then we just change their, uh, all their essays and coach them on interviews, and they get into multiple schools the next cycle. Nothing, uh, stuff like nothing from their experiences changes other than more hours. So the angle you take uh, has, to be, um, has to be much, much stronger than... Um, than you might have done in the past. Uh, someone asks, should we include an activity that we will be pursuing in the coming months? For example, if we have a job lined up for a gap here but haven't started yet, can we include it? Yeah, that would be information you can include in your work and activity section. Uh, do we have to talk about life events like immigrating to the USA, being a transfer student, or like taking the MCAT twice in the personal statement? So that's a, that's a pretty big category, life events. Um, you don't have to talk about any specific life event, uh, though you're welcome to. You might talk about um, your immigration experience to the US if it fits that's if it fits again the narrative that you're trying to communicate through your personal statement. Being a transfer student, you can mention it if uh, again if you know if that was sort of formative for you and serves as a nice transition point or meaningful point in your path to medicine. Uh, you could talk about that. Taking the MCAT twice, um, I don't know that I would uh, include that because it's very common to do it and I don't know what you would say about it, frankly. Um, and they will see that you took it multiple times. Now, if you, I suspect that you're asking because maybe your first score was really low. Um, this comes up too when students, you know, have a rough first term or first year in college, like should they talk about that? Um, usually the answer is no, uh, unless there was like an acute thing that happened. Like let's say there was a, a passing in your family um, that was really unfortunate and sort of derailed your studies for that year. That makes sense. But, you know, the thing about, you know, I had a rough time transitioning to college and stuff like that, that's not particularly compelling. So when you're writing your personal statement, don't come at it from a defensive angle, meaning don't use it as an opportunity to explain away the problems. Use it as an opportunity to talk about, you know, why you're going to be a great doctor. Um, and, and think about those very compelling anecdotes. All right, so someone asks, how do you navigate writing about an international medical volunteer experience while negating the assumption I'm engaging in medical volunteerism? Um, again, it's not the topic that matters, but what you write about it. So if you just write the usual, like, I went to this place, we didn't speak the language, but I did this thing and they, you know, they started crying and they connected and that's the moment I knew. That's, that's going to fall on deaf ears. So you have to ask yourself, what is it that I'm trying to communicate? And are there specific anecdotes that get at that thing um, that's, uh, that's a big piece in this overall story that I'm trying to tell. So that's the lens you have to view it through. I'm seeing a lot of questions about, is it okay to talk about this? Is it okay to talk about that? Yes, yes, yes. They're all okay to talk about. It's how you do it and why you do it. In other words, in service of what are you writing about that topic? If you dropped a course due to a family death, should you include that or not draw attention to it on your application? If you have like one W on your application um, and there is no like major pattern of Ws, then I would just leave it alone. Um, let's see here. Would you recommend starting a little outside the scope of medicine in terms, uh, sorry, as people are typing questions, moving, uh, formative activities and then going down to the why as the example did or starting directly with medicine? Either way is fine. Uh, so this, the, the example I gave you started with something non-medical and funneled down. You could start something with medical, like something medically relevant and stay there. Um, either, way, either way is fine, um, depending on which experiences you use and how things transition. I have a lot of research experience compared to my quote unquote medical experience right now. Um, can I use the personal statement to explain why I had started out with research but ultimately shifted to only medicine? Um, you could, um, but, but make sure to highlight what it, what it was about the, um, I guess, the, the 
the clinical side that has drawn you more and more and how your research informed it. I wouldn't write it as though it's like, I was doing all this research, but less into it now. And now I want to focus on people. Don't, don't talk about it like that because they want you, they want to know that you like the science and that you're interested in applying the science. So I would more frame it as like, what lens has my research allowed me to develop that has allowed me to serve patients better and the, you know, the benefits of the transactional nature of, of research and clinical care. Uh, would you advise against mentioning your childhood and wanting to be a doctor when I was younger and coming back to that dream in college, or is it better to just focus on the more, uh, I assume you meant to say, relevant experiences from college? Um, it is totally okay to write about um, something in childhood and then, you know, bring it to full speed. Now, if you start in childhood, you want to quickly zoom ahead and talk about, you know, yourself today or in recent years. You see in the sample intro I gave to talking about Tourette's syndrome, I was like age eight or something in that story. And that's totally fine as long as you're using it to set the stage for something you intend to write later. How would you recommend picking three meaningful activities if we have multiple impactful activities? You just have to ask yourself which are the three most meaningful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't overthink that. I would make sure that at least one of them is directly medically relevant or two of them. Not all three have to be, though they could. Um, it would be strange, however, if all three were not medically relevant um, because then they would question if you want to be a doctor. Like if I said, I like playing uh, tennis, I like making art and riding horses, uh, they're going to be like, okay, these are your three most meaningful. It's strange that you're applying to, to be a physician. So that's the only thing you really need to be mindful of. Um, but otherwise, um, but otherwise, it's pretty flexible. And there's a, there's a quite large guide on our site on the work and activity section with many, there's like 20 examples, I think. Um, someone says, thank you. Um, and the entire staff, yeah, thank you to the staff for sure. Um, it was very helpful and you appreciate it. Uh, thank you for saying that. It's certainly my pleasure to, to give this chat. But I see that the questions are um, not coming in anymore. So I guess we'll break here. And thank you guys again for participating. Uh, I hope you got the value from it that you were seeking and stay safe out there. Thank you all and have a great day. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.